Hello there, my name is Jennifer, the co-founder of Music for Inbox, and today we are going to have an artist chat with Cassie Estrep, the other co-founder, and Jennifer Trudeau, a representative from the Campbell House. So let me just get them on here. There's Cassie, hi! Hi there! There you are. Hi. Hello. <laughs> well, welcome you both. Um, oh, no, I'll just kind of introduce. We're going to have a conversation about um, this project that we've been developing in collaboration with Music for Inbox and the Gamble House um, that brings music into the Gamble House and um, and really celebrates it in a in a in a way that I think was more complete than we had even hoped for. Um, so I have like a couple nerdy questions for the two of you for our conversation today. Um, my first one, Jennifer, is to you. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, we've been referenced, you know, we've been blabbing on our social media about Gamble House, Gamble House, but for people <laughs> who have never been there, what is the Gamble House? I know there's a great description. It's the most complete and best preserved work of American arts and craft architects. Charles and Henry Green, but this is much more than a complete, like a structure. Um, can you talk to us about what the gamble is and what it means about how completely preserved this, um, this space is? Sure, yeah. Um, the Gamble House uh, was built in 1908. It was completed in 1909. And then over the next two years or so, all of these furnishings um, that you see in the house were completed uh, to the designs of the architects. So they were all made for the house. So everything that we have in terms of the contents is the original furniture that the Gamble family had here in 1909 uh, through 1911 when they were first living here. So the fact that Charles and Henry Green designed all this furniture for the house is unusual enough, but the fact that everything is intact and still with us so that we can see the whole idea behind this sort of total work of art, as we say, uh, is, is what's really unusual about the house. So the family gave the house uh, to the city of Pasadena along with all of its contents, and even the few pieces that had gone to people sort of that they'd inherited, you know, a chair that was made for them and this sort of thing, uh, all those pieces have come back to the house now, so we have an almost wow. complete collection. Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> and Cassia, so for you, you you have a history with the Gamble House. You This has been a dream project for you for years. And what, can you tell us about like your history with the Gamble House and what made you want to make music there? Well, I was, um, I don't have any formal history, but I am a <laughs> Pasadena resident and I, I live quite nearby. And so um, it's on my jogging route. It's on like when I drop my kids off at school, it's on the way in and out. I mean, I pretty much pass it multiple times a day. And I've always just, I've, I've been on the docent led tours and been in the spaces and thought about this connection. You know, I'm a string player violist and um, the person who made my viola, which is of course a wooden instrument, um, lives in Silver Lake. And I have a really strong connection with him. And we treat this viola as kind of this living, breathing object. And it's not sort of frozen in time and it, kind of changes and you know I um, lived for years without air conditioning and so the viola got a lot of sweat on it and a lot of like <laughs> wear and tear which my luthier Michael Fisher was really generous to say like oh I love working on your instrument because it it feels like a real thing it feels like something that an actual musician is using and so I knew I had this connection to my personal you know wooden object and then going through the gamble house and looking at it and realizing this is more than just sort of something with a stanchion that separates the public from the space this is a mm. this was a home people actually lived here mm -hmm. these there's sort of I mean there's not visible wear in this house it's gorgeous and pristine but there it feels it feels real it feels like people had a connection there and they lived there and they enjoyed the morning light in this room and then they might move to the afternoon light in the next room and I was wondering if there was a way to to bring this string quartet you know with our wooden objects into this other space and um, explore a lot of the themes that Green and Green Architectural Firm was looking into, you know, in terms of innovation, in terms of borrowing ideas from other things that they had seen and, and treating architecture as this living, breathing thing and not, again, this sort of frozen in time idea, which is my approach to music and to playing a stringed instrument, um, especially because the stringed instrument was sort of 
formalized so many hundreds of years ago. <laughs> it's nice to continually update it and to reconnect. Um, so I was really curious and incredibly grateful to the Gamble House Foundation and organization for allowing us to have this kind of access to their space so that we can make this video yeah. of these well, string quartets. And I, I love this connection you make between like the instrument as a piece of art and this house as a piece of art. And, and I think that's something that um, I was wondering, Jennifer, if you could talk a little bit more. Um, the Gamble House mission uses this phrase, architecture of fine, as fine art, which of course it is, but I think it often gets overlooked in the fine arts. And can you talk to us about like the things that elevate this structure from um, kind of like a utilitarian space to a piece of fine art? Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, one of the things we love about having musicians here is it's like there's different ways that, um, you know, different artists kind of interpret the house. We've mostly had photographers here interpreting the house. Um, but when we have musicians in here, we realize that it's a form of interpretation for them, too. Um, you know, that that kind of connection between um, a wooden instrument and wooden furniture and the wood paneling of the spaces and all that is very real for us as soon as musicians come in. So the... Um, you know, it, it, I've forgotten your original question. <laughs> well, but so there are so many features of this house that are, oh, that are elevate, really art. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that, um, you know, one of the things we see, for example, behind me here, there's a, an art glass um, uh, cabinet front um, next here next to the fireplace. And everywhere you look in the house, there are these kinds of artistic details that, um, you know, like, for example, here is a, a switch plate for a light switch. And, you know, a lot of people have these put but push button lights, which is still in their houses, or maybe you've never seen one before. But if you look at the, um, the shape of the plate, the shape mm -hmm. of the plate echoes things like the shape of the, um, the wood. And so everything is kind of knitted together. So that there's this continuity of all the motifs that are used in the house um, that hold together things like from this utilitarian things like this light switch plate to the, the furniture to the built-ins. Um, we were looking the other day at some invoices for uh, a green and green desk. And to just build the desk itself uh, costs about $25 which, you know, was uh, kind of a lot of money then. Um, but to do the inlay on the desk uh, in sterling silver and all these different woods and things like that, the inlay costs four times as much as just building the desk. So it's a real mm -hmm. commitment on the part of the uh, of the clients. Um, and all the time that it went into uh, to design that inlay, um, you know, the materials that are used and the way these materials all come together in this one piece. Um, there's a lot of things that, um, you know, once Green and Green around 1908 had the, the wherewithal to attract these wealthier clients, um, they were really able to take their art so much farther uh, because of the support that they had from those clients. And the Gamble House is a perfect example of that. Right. That's a, it's like a very beautiful patronage kind of situation that they exactly. create for themselves. Yeah, yeah it's it really yeah. beautiful. Um, and Cassia, so the way the video is constructed, um, it doesn't just feature the Gamble House. I think that's something that's really, that was a real decision that was made. Instead of just to play music in the space, it was to have the music reflect on the space and have the space reflect back the music. So can you talk about how the, how we decided to like highlight certain things about this house and how, how the project brings a lot of different resources together to do a kind of storytelling of, of the space through music. Yeah, well, I think that we wanted to show it as, as a home and uh, to explore themes of home. And in fact, some of the pieces, especially the works by Pamela Z, um, I mean, one of them is actually called Home and has people using the word home, saying it over and over again. And in, for that movement, um, you know, at Music for Inbox between Jennifer Biorsi and I, we came up with these ideas of um, having people, you know, in the powder room, brushing their teeth in time to the music and people in the upper linen closet, folding linens, all these domestic tasks, all these things that we're assuming somebody did in the space. Um, we had somebody in the kitchen peeling potatoes um, and somebody else uh, in the butler's pantry. I think is that. I'm probably saying all the names of the rooms wrong, yeah, but anyhow, no, no, <laughs> the downstairs butler's pantry in this sort of <laughs> informal space, um, drying the dishes. 
and we really wanted to, um, yeah, again, like we want to take down that, I keep talking about like the velvet rope, you know, that separates mm -hmm. the, the public from this space, because I understand that line. I mean, at least I think I do that the gamble house is trying to walk in preservation of this space, but at the same time in helping people relate to it as a real space and understand how that worked. And so we were so fortunate that we were given the access we were given um, to be able to go through all these rooms with a camera to explore these themes of innovation through the music, but then of course to show the innovation with the video and then explore these themes of home with the music, but then again, you know, to reflect that in the um, visual as well. And I feel like that created some stronger connections and it also gives people access to the Gamble House in a way that they wouldn't otherwise have, especially right now where, in fact, I believe the in-person in-house tours are uh, closed for the moment. Um, although there, there still are tours of the, out ground, of the grounds outside, which I highly recommend because sort of <laughs> everywhere you rest your eyes is just something so beautiful to look at. <laughs> I hope that answered your question, Jennifer. Yeah, about, okay. it did. Yeah, and and actually, it, oh, sorry, bumps the thing. Uh, it it brought me to kind of my next question that I wanted to ask Jennifer, which is this kind of tension between like preserving and protecting the house, and also giving people access and um and 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 bringing it into like modern conversations and modern uh, culture. How how do you guys approach that, and what how do you like straddle those two worlds? Yeah, it's always an issue for us, like on a daily basis, it's something that we're thinking about. And that kind of like that duality of preservation and access is the, 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 the way that it's always framed um, in the in the field. So uh, one of the things that we've been trying to do, well, one of the things I've been trying to do is take down some of the velvet ropes. <laughs> um, and that always makes our docents really nervous. Um, <laughs> because they're the ones who are uh, on a daily basis have to kind of like you know, shepherd people around the house and make sure they don't go where they're supposed to, not supposed to go. But to me, it's like as soon as you take down that rope, you just get a completely different experience of the, of the room. And as an architectural historian, I always want people to see the room um, spatially the way that it was meant to be seen. And in some cases, you know, like uh, I, I'm doing something right now that I don't normally do in the living room. I'm actually sitting down. On, I, we do sit on the built-in furniture in here occasionally, but we never sit on the, uh, the chairs and things like that. Um, but so I'm experiencing the room from this lower position rather than uh, where my head would be if I was standing. And even just that gives you this idea of just like the, the kind of the sense of repose that you get from the room. Mm -hmm. um, it has this kind of very low datum line. All the door heights are only six foot four instead of six foot seven. Um, so that feeling that you get when you're able to kind of explore a space uh, in, in, from a different perspective um, physically is, is something that um, we're conscious of. But also just, you know, the fact that we have here in the living room, we have all these 110-year-old um, rugs that were designed by Charles Green and made for us in a special factory that made artist carpet, carpets in Bohemia. Um, you know, these are really kind of uh, precious artifacts really and we need to protect them so the reason that people come in and see the light levels are a little bit lower than they might be comfortable with um, part of that is because we're trying to protect this collection but at the same time we want people to really feel what the space is like so that's you know something that we have to balance so I, I think you're absolutely right Cassie that some of these things that we that we um uh, you know, that you were able to do when you made the video really do kind of um, domesticate the space a little bit more. And every time we have kind of special events like that, we like to be able to give a little bit on, um, on uh, you know, give you a little bit more access in order to show it to other people that way. So, mm -hmm. you know, there was even something so wonderful the day that you were here about that whole thing about trying to get um, the coffee percolator to work. And, um, you know, the, just the idea that there'd be a coffee percolator up in the kitchen that we normally, you know, don't have anything. Uh, uh, there's no, usually no steam and no heat and all those things that you associate with a kitchen, no smells <laughs> in our kitchen. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, there's just the implication that you get from just seeing a percolating pot of coffee. Um, you know, it makes you kind of imagine all those other sensory things that are part of a home that you normally wouldn't experience in the Gamble House. So just that, that kind of suggestion of it is something that we're really happy to get out to people. I know there were a lot of creative things com uh, coming out of that day, and we we're really happy, especially um, to have uh, uh, Noel McCarthy to, to kind of bring some of that to life uh, working with you guys. Yeah, the director for uh, Noel is our director, and 
his his eye for the house is just impeccable and yeah. um it was a real gift to be there on filming day and see the house kind of through the lens yeah. literally of yeah. his of his viewpoint it was beautiful yeah um it's mad and just hearing i mean i i came upstairs and just the house was just full of music and it was so intense and so <laughs> exciting and you know it's just especially during this time where we haven't had very many people in here right well and so something beautiful that we're able to do um, with partnership with Pasadena Art Night is even though people can't go into the house, we're going to have a outdoor event that celebrates kind of this multi, um, multi -per perspective viewpoint of the house where this video of the interior is going to be projected onto the exterior of the house. And we're calling it Gamble House Inside Out. It's pretty literal. You're going to see the Gamble House like <laughs> switched inside out. Um, and we can all view the video on the lawn. And then there will also be a, um, a gallery space from the visual artist who made work from this month. And there will be five paintings installed on one of the exterior living porches um, for viewing, which is a really cool thing because um, – I know we've talked uh, a lot uh, between us about the fact that those exterior living spaces, they're intended to kind of be like rooms without walls. Is that right, Jennifer? Yeah, very much, so, yes. So there are these kind of invisible walls in the way it was designed, and we're going to hang art on the invisible walls, which is very <laughs> cool. <laughs> yes. So that's happening on Friday from right. 6 to 10 p.m. at the Gamble House, and it's free. So I wanted to say that for anyone watching. <laughs> um, and then I had one question left for the both of you. You kind of touched on it. Um, was there anything through this project that kind of surprised you about the Gamble House or, or something that you, some kind of angle or, um, or experience that was just uh, different for either of you that you didn't expect to happen? Cassie, um, I can first? go first. Yeah, I think for me, um, I didn't expect it to, as, as much as we had this theory of, oh, you know, we can take down the velvet rope and it really feels like a space. I, I really thought that I would still feel like I was in a museum, you know, playing my instrument very gingerly kind of thing. And um, that's my ginger bow hold. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, I was surprised at how quickly I started to feel like I kind of belonged there. And I thought it was a real testament to the design, honestly. And I, and I also felt like, um, I think between all of the musicians, we kept, you know, you'd sit there when you're waiting to do another take or um, working something out and your eyes would just rest on anything, you know, just in your line of sight. And it was just, it was just a really enjoyable experience to have your eyes rest on something that was so beautiful. I mean, I keep using that word over and over again, but to see, to notice those things that Jennifer was pointing out, like, oh, I feel like I've seen that bumpy line before. And then you're thinking like, I think that was a staircase. And then, oh, that was the upstairs. And, and there was one point when I was uh, on the video day, I was waiting to do a take. So I was standing in the um, room upstairs with the toilet, and then I was going to go into the powder room or there's, you know, to show those two doors. And I'm standing in this tiny space and the door is closed and I'm right at the door and I'm just waiting for them to tell me my cue. And I just sort of thought, you know, this is a really amazing experience to just be here. <laughs> and it's just me and I'm just in this little tiny, beautiful, tiny toilet room I mean, <laughs> with every detail totally kind of attended to and this beautiful um, doors and the glass on the doors. And I think, yeah, I think so. I think long answer long, I felt really surprised by um, how quickly it felt like home and mm -hmm. also um, how kind of it just sort of takes you over. Like it just sort of, it's bigger than you are kind of thing. And you're just in this space having this experience without any kind of prompt. Like it mm -hmm. just kind of happens. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that was, that was a surprising thing for me about the video and the audio day. Yeah. yeah. Jennifer, do you yeah, have I, any? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that really it was just that, that experience of hearing the sound in the space that was mm -hmm. that I described that was really the most striking thing for me. Um, but, I, you know, I've had that same experience. Um, I've been involved with the house since, <clears throat> since 2004 when I became a docent. Um, and we do welcome a new uh, class of volunteer docents and train them uh, every year. Uh, so, I, you know, I've been involved with the house for a long time. And I joined the staff four years ago and um, as curator of the house. And once you have that kind of other level of access, uh, like everyone was able to have that day that you were filming, it, it's true, it does kind of suck you in and you start to see it differently. Um, because we don't like people to come here and feel like they're not at home. And yet at the same time, like we talked about, you know, you, you want people to be respectful, you want people not to be touching things and not <laughs> leaning against things and all that. Um, and that goes for when we're doing special filming and things like that in here too. Uh, but it, so I think that people who have come and have maybe a little bit of a static experience of it, maybe would be surprised at how quickly, um, how quickly you can get comfortable as soon as the, mm -hmm. that barrier is lifted a little bit, which is, you know, why, you know, we've tried to take down velvet ropes and things like that just to give people just that that feeling of repose in here even if they have to kind of still maintain that uh, distance a little bit from from the actual materials yeah yeah thank you so much jennifer for for letting us in that space <laughs> and it was supporting this project yeah it, it, it really felt like you know in the beginning of this conversation when you were talking about how green and green benefited from the philanthropy of the gamble family in terms of supporting their work we really feel like you're paying it forward yeah i mean perfect. that this space is there with all of these amazing objects and mm -hmm. and, the, and allowing artists to have access i mean this is a, a real form of patronage and mm -hmm. um you know, and we the, don't take those you. collaborations really surprise us every time and really allow us to see in the house in a different way, mm -hmm. as well as allowing everybody to whom it's less familiar to see it in a different way. So that's, you know, it, it's 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 such a mutually beneficial uh, arrangement. Yeah, it's beautiful. Well, thank you both so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.